Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Hari Kirtan Das. Hari is a lifelong student of yoga, meditation, and Eastern spiritual philosophies. Hari Kirtan lived full-time in devotional yoga ashrams and intentional spiritual communities from 1977 to 1981, and again from 1995 to 1998. He was formally initiated into the Gaudiya Vaishnava lineage of Bhakti Yoga in 1978. Hari Kirtan is an ERYT 500 registered yoga teacher and received an 800-hour training certification from the Jiva Mukti Yoga School. He began teaching contemporary yoga classes in 2009 and has since gone on to develop yoga teacher training courses and is a sought-after guest teacher for numerous yoga teacher training programs. He leads yoga workshops, offers presentations for personal and professional development, and regularly takes students on yoga adventures in India. He currently lives and teaches in Washington, D.C. So with that, hello, Hari. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Jacob. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on Chidheads. Yeah, it's exciting to talk to you. I actually just finished uh, reading your lovely new book, In Search of the Highest Truth, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, before we, but before we get into that, I'd love to hear, Hari, um, what is the story of your practice and what brought you to the study of yoga and yoga philosophy? I had a spontaneous attraction to yoga and yoga philosophy even when I was very young. Uh, my role model, the person I wanted to be when I grew up, was Gomez Adams mm. from the Adams family, uh, who I <laughs> first experienced in Charles Adams' cartoons and then as the sitcom in the 1960s. And uh, Gomez was the president of the Yoga Society in his fictional world, which at the time uh, was something that made him uh, all the more eccentric as opposed to now where yoga is a pretty mainstream practice. Um, I read Siddhartha when I was young and and I realized for sure that my serious spiritual path was going to take me in the direction of India. Of course, growing up in the 60s uh, in uh, the New York area, I was surrounded by the hippie counterculture, which really embraced the kind of uh, psychedelic version of Indian spirituality, uh, much to the chagrin of my parents, I might add. (laughs) Um, And so I began practicing to the extent that I was able to on my own as a teenager. I I, uh, basically practiced uh, everything in the back end of Be Here Now, uh, Ram Dass's groundbreaking book. Uh, And I was part of a group of friends that were all interested in different aspects of spirituality uh, and yoga. Uh, So... I opted not to go to college after high school. Instead, I uh, decided to pursue a career in experimental uh, analog electronic music, which is, uh, I assure you, at the time was a very lucrative career path. Oh, yeah, I bet. Uh, So after a few years of that, having absolutely nothing to renounce, it became very easy for me to pursue uh, uh, the life of a renunciate as a brahmachari in a yoga ashram. And uh, it was during during those years in my early 20s that I seriously studied yoga philosophy, particularly bhakti yoga, Krishna bhakti, uh, and practiced mantra meditation for basically 24-7 for several years. Mm. And that really provided me with the grounding in spiritual philosophy that I share with my yoga students today. Yeah. So what was it about the Krishna Bhakti tradition that attracted you as opposed to some of the other traditions that you might have um, uh, gone down the path of? At first, I wasn't attracted to it at all. I thought, uh, this is not even... Quali- this this doesn't even qualify as mythology. This looks more like uh, fairy tales to me. Uh, I was much more attracted to Zen Buddhism. Mm. Uh, I, I uh, spent a fair amount of time sitting in front of my wall uh, <laughs> doing, doing meditation. I, I was living in my parents' basement at the time, and uh, 
I had my own conception of meditation where I thought if I just listened hard enough, I would hear the whole universe. Mm. And, and what I heard was the boiler, actually. That's, <laughs> that's what I heard. Um, but, I, but, you know, I had that idea. I uh, then kind of moved in the direction of Taoism. Mm. Uh, and it took a while to feel comfortable with the idea of, of a theistic yoga philosophy or uh, uh, the idea that I was not God, that I was never going to be God, because if I had to meditate in order to realize I was God, then clearly I wasn't ever going to become God, because God doesn't have to meditate in order to realize he's God. Uh, just the logic of that took a while to make sense to me just because uh, I was determined not to accept it. Uh, after a while, I started chanting the Hare Krishna mantra if for no other reason because it was something I hadn't done yet. Mm -hmm. And it was once I actually started practicing mantra meditation with the Hare Krishna mantra that the sky started to open up for me, that I started to have realizations that felt very, very concrete, very real. Uh, it was almost as if a veil was being lifted. And I had no other thing going on in my life that was different other than I had adopted this particular form of meditation. And after one particularly mind-blowing realization, I had a job. Once upon a time, there was no internet. It's hard for people to actually wrap their heads around that, especially younger people. But once upon a time, the only way to get a document from one office building to another office building is to was to mimeograph it, Google it. Uh, in case you're wondering, like, what that? No means. idea what that is. <laughs> yeah, of course, right. You just have to look it up. Anyway, the, only, the way you made a copy was through this process called mimeograph, uh, and then that made a hard copy of your document, and then someone had to pick it up and walk it over to an office across town. So I, my job was to walk all around Midtown Manhattan, bringing a document from one office building to another office building on the other side of town, and I spent the whole time that I was walking, synchronizing my breath to my stride and synchronizing the mantra to my breath and my stride. So I just walked around Manhattan all day chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. It's a great walking or running mantra because it's totally symmetrical mm. and it's easy to get into a groove with it. Well, after about a month of just doing that all day, I remember very uh, distinctly, you know, sometimes we have realizations that just stay with us forever. It's, it's just such uh, an intense moment. I was walking eastbound on the south side of 42nd Street between 6th and 5th Avenue, right alongside Bryant Park. And all of a sudden, it was as if the world was moving very quickly, but I was moving in slow motion. And my my world just kind of stopped, and I had this realization that I had a bazillion lives worth of karma mm. that I was accountable for, and I wasn't really doing anything to burn it up, to respond to this karmic uh, uh, obligation that I had been generating for who knows how many lives. Mm. And that's when I determined that, A, I needed to stop everything and do something about that because that became the top priority. And B, I had to credit the fact that I was chanting this mantra with that realization. And therefore, I had to go deeper into understanding what this mantra was about, why it had the effect that it had. And that's when I made the determination that I needed to do that full time and learn the philosophy behind the mantra in order to understand what it was, how it worked, um, et cetera. So you didn't have much familiarity with the philosophy around the tradition prior to just the practice of the Hare Krishna mantra? Is that essentially what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I I read the Bhagavad Gita a couple of times. The first time, I didn't understand it at all. The second time, I understood enough to get the idea that it was telling me that I was not God and someone else was, and therefore I rejected it. And then once I picked up the practice, 
then I started doing the svadhyaya. The, so, so the practice came first. And the practice, I think, was the purifying element that I needed in order to make the uh, directed self-study effective. Mm. So, yeah, that's so, so the sequence was practice first, some illumination as a result or insight as a result of the practice, and then the uh, study of the philosophy. And I found that what I once thought was just a kind of uh, sentimental approach to spirituality actually had a very, very rich literary tradition behind it and a very deep and comprehensive philosophy that gave a logical, reasonable explanation for what otherwise appeared to be preposterous. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so that actually that's a good segue now because I want to talk a little bit about about your book, which is again, I'm, as I mentioned, in search of the highest truth, and um, I want to talk about the the Socratic um, way in which a lot of it is 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 um, is written, which I thought was really lovely, uh, based on you know your own classes and a tra- uh, I imagine it's in, you know sort of edited transcripts of of some of your trainings, correct? Yes, some that's of the correct. chapters. Um, mm-hmm. But before we talk about that a little bit, what 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 from your perspective is this is like the most basic question there is. <laughs> what is what is yoga philosophy for someone who's maybe just downloaded this podcast because it said yoga philosophy? They want to know sort of what the gist of is. What is the the Cliff Notes version from your perspective? Well, my understanding of yoga philosophy, <clears throat> philosophy is, uh, you know, the study of uh, or the inquiry into uh, the nature of the truth. Uh, what is the cause of the world? How do we come to be? What is our reason for being here and what should we be doing? Uh, it's the study of uh, an underlying basis for knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yoga, now yoga, of course, means many things to many people, uh, not just in terms of, you know, we can make up whatever definition of yoga we want, because I don't subscribe to that idea at all, but rather different schools of yoga have different conceptions of what is the underlying premise, what is the practice, and what is the goal. So if we take yoga to mean union, a dynamic force that links one thing to another thing or one person to another person, uh, or the alignment of the self with one's eternal nature, uh, alignment with cosmic order or harmony with cosmic order. The extrication of the self from the not-self would be a good definition of yoga from the standpoint of Patanjali yeah. uh, and his yoga sutras. Uh, the distinction between the eternal spiritual being and the temporary material body-mind combination. Um, So yoga philosophy, then, would be the systematic uh, study of the true nature of one's being, Uh, the process by which the true nature of the self is realized by the practitioner of yoga, and therefore the understanding of what is that true nature and how do we recognize it when we see it. Um, so that would be my definition of, of yoga philosophy, the underlying, the, the study of the uh, underlying uh, basis of, of knowledge by which uh, we have a th- uh, gain a theoretical understanding of the true nature of the self uh, that we can therefore uh, practically apply in order to have the experience of the true nature of the self. Mm -hmm. And so a common misunderstanding then, you know, just based on what you're saying would be some, because I'm hearing you say the true nature of the self. Well, we have a very, you know, popular um, vocabulary uh, in our culture of finding the self. And and usually that's finding the personality, but that's not what you're saying uh, based on yoga philosophy. So could you kind of unpack, you know, what the difference is between what I see as you saying the capital S self and, and the small s self that we might say is what most people think of as the self. Sure. I actually like to think of it as there are three s's. We normally see two, a lowercase s and an uppercase s. Mm -hmm. 
But from my perspective, I think you need to think of this of the self in three aspects. The first is the personality that we identify with at any given point in time in our lives. So when we're a child, we identify with a particular personality that likes this and doesn't like that, you know? Um, I like pudding, I don't like broccoli. Uh, then as you get older, um, you have a new set of likes and dislikes and a new sense of what's good for you and what's not good for you. And as you age, these things keep changing. And at every point along the way, we think, that's me. I'm the person who likes Pink Floyd and doesn't like Justin Bieber. Uh, I don't think I've ever even heard Justin Bieber, but I... <laughs> I think you probably have and you don't even realize you have. That's, that's <laughs> entirely likely. Uh, I do get out into the world enough that odds are I, I just didn't know that that's what I was hearing. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a safe assumption that I make, though, based on what I've seen. Um, and we think this is who I am, except that this conception of who I am keeps changing. And if we think about it, the person we really are is the person who can observe all of these changes at these various stages of our lives. So there's the really small s, which is the misidentification of the eternal self with the temporary self, the, uh, both the mind and the body. We think what happens to this body happens to me. There's a slightly larger case self who is the consciousness, the person who experiences all these changes, but is somehow or other under the influence of illusion and misidentifying with these changes as being the self. And it is the process of yoga that awakens that sort of middle-sized self to the realization that that's not me, that I'm more than that, that, that there's something beyond these temporary designations or states of being that experiences all these states of being, and I need to find out who that person is. Then the capital S, the, the big S, is the supreme self living within the heart of each individual self. In Sanskrit, this would be the param atma, the paramount soul, living within the heart of each atma or individual soul. And there's innumerable individual souls, that would be you, me, and everybody else, but only one paramatma who is distributed in the heart of all living beings. Um, so this way, you have three S's. The little s, which is the temporary misidentified self, the middle-sized s, who is experiencing all the changes of the mind and body and may be under the influence of illusion or maybe uh, through the process of yoga uh, under the influence of reality or cognizant of their true nature. And then the supreme self uh, with whom the middle self has a relationship. And bhakti yoga is the... Uh, illumination and realization, the experience of that relationship between the infinitesimal self and the infinite self. Mm -hmm. So what struck me about what you said about um, the Paramatma be living in the heart of, of every being, it was something that, you know, in my in my Christian upbringing, you would hear a lot in, in more evangelical notions of relationships with Jesus Christ. And so I'm curious... If you, um, what, what your thoughts are on, is there, is there a compare, a comparison to be made there? Like for someone listening who, who might hear that and, and, uh, I don't know, and immediately hear that kind of notion, um, from their own religious background, is, is that an understandable comparison or is there a separate, is there a difference in terms of what the overall kind of philosophical import is of that or spiritual import? There's definitely a connection, I think. When I was younger and I was looking at various spiritual traditions, I looked at the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth by reading the New Testament, and I just didn't get it at all. I was totally bewildered by everything in the Bible. <laughs> then when I read the Bhagavad Gita 
And I had some guidance in understanding the Gita and was part of a satsang that was uh, engaged in studying the Gita. And then when I went back, then it became very clear to me that if you just take away all the other stuff that surrounds the teachings of Jesus, what I saw was Jesus is teaching bhakti yoga, pure, unalloyed devotion to God. And once I understood the teachings of Jesus in terms of bhakti yoga, it became very clear to me that there was no contradiction here, that uh, everything that Jesus of Nazareth taught was also being taught in the tradition of bhakti yoga coming from India. Uh, I find that when I teach uh, devotional yoga as part of yoga teacher trainings, the people who have the easiest time relating to this are people who come from the Catholic tradition, who are familiar with mystical uh, Christianity. Yeah. And the people who have the hardest time are biblical literalists yeah. in the evangelical uh, tradition. Right. And sometimes I've been able to find the right words to turn the light on for someone who comes from a more evangelical or uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, fundamentalist? Not fundamentalist. Fundamentalism. I mean, that's hard. If you're if you're really really uh, locked in to biblical literalism and a, or religious fundamentalism of any kind then it's very, very difficult to step outside of that box, of yeah. that model. Uh, people who are members of gospel churches, uh, on the other hand, uh, find it easier really? to relate to kirtan, hmm. to, to chanting, to singing, uh, get up and dance and praise the Lord. Uh, and it's those people that I've somehow or other uh, been fortunate enough to find a way to say the right thing to make it clear that their practice of yoga is not in conflict with their religious beliefs, with their uh, expression of faith that they're comfortable with. And so doing yoga, teaching yoga, practicing yoga, there's, there's, there's no conflict. Um, it's very rare that you get someone who is committed to a fundamentalist understanding of religion to come even into a yoga class come into a yoga yeah. class yeah uh, for the most part <clears throat> uh, that's discouraged within the uh, fundamentalist community so so it's rare that you even see those people and get a chance to speak with them so um, I just want to ask one more question on this because I'm just sort yeah. of curious because I, I I feel like I know what the answer is but I'm gonna ask anyway so then is G is Jesus are Jesus and Krishna two faces of the same being or I mean is that essentially the idea or is it something else something else uh, <laughs> In, in uh, the New Testament, Jesus is teaching devotion to God. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is teaching devotion to himself. Mm -hmm. Right. So Krishna makes a distinction between himself and everyone else in the Bhagavad Gita. In the fourth chapter, uh, Arjuna asks, um, Krishna tells Arjuna, what I'm teaching you, I taught to the sun god a gazillion years ago. And Arjuna says, hold the phone. I've known you our whole lives. We're cousins. And I, now you're telling me that a zillion years ago, you taught uh, this same science to the sun god who was born way before you. How is that possible? And then Krishna makes that the distinction really clear. Many births you and I have had, I remember them all. You don't. And the reason is simple. I'm God. You're not. <laughs> So there's a clear distinction bet uh, between God and everyone else, and that's also present in the Yoga Sutras, where Patanjali describes Ishvara as Purusha Vishesha, uh, a person, but an exceptional person, not like any other person. So Jesus uh, is speaking about devotion to the Supreme Person, 
He's not saying be uh, devoted to me. He is, does say, uh, I can teach you how to get there, which is the, I think, proper understanding of you come to God through me because I'm the transparent via medium through which that relationship can be realized. The deification of Jesus doesn't show up in Jesus's teachings about himself. It shows up in uh, the Gospel of Paul. And one nice way to uh, explore the teachings of Jesus is to get what is called the Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson was accused of being an atheist. And in order to counter that accusation, he took a blade and sliced out all the teachings of Jesus from the New Testament and then put them together into their own little book, which is a very small book. And then he said, no, I'm not an atheist. I believe in the teachings of Jesus. I just don't believe in all the stuff that surrounds them that distract from the teachings of Jesus, and here they are. So uh, for those who are interested in simply hearing what Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth has to say and what his teachings are and what his example is, uh, look for the Jefferson Bible, which separates those teachings out from all the rest of the stuff in the New Testament. That's so cool. I've never heard of that before, and I'm totally going to go on Amazon as soon as this is over and get that. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So now I want to um, talk a little bit about some stuff that you had talked about in your book. And one of them, one one really useful um, breakdown that you offer in one of your chapters is what you call the five functions of yoga philosophy. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you will talk a little bit about what those five functions are. Sure. Um, now, I should uh, give a little preamble here in that the first four functions I borrowed from Joseph Campbell okay. and then retrofit them into yoga as opposed to myth, which was where Campbell was applying them. So the first one is a metaphysical function. The metaphysical function is the function of how you see the divine nature of the world. So yoga facilitates a, uh, the ability to see the world as a transformation of spiritual energy. And the practice of yoga re-spiritualizes everything. Um, the Vedanta Sutra, which is, Vedanta is one of the other schools of philosophy or ways of seeing Darshan mm -hmm. from the Indian subcontinent. And there's a very strong relationship between Vedanta and yoga. So the Yo Vedanta Sutras describe that the material world comes into being as a transformation of spiritual energies. So the metaphysical function of yoga is the function that allows us to see the divine nature of the world or how the world is actually a transformation, the material world is a transformation of spiritual energies. The second function is a cosmological function. Yoga provides us with a map that has a circle on it and an arrow that says, you are here. <laughs> so it shows you where you are in relationship to the world, uh, in relationship to reality, uh, how to get to anywhere from where you are, uh, specifically uh, how to get from a condition of illusory misidentification of the self as the not-self to the state of residing or abiding in one's true spiritual nature. So a map. Yeah. Um, the... A uh, third function is a sociological function. The culture of yoga provides us with a social system that's designed to promote the spiritual advancement of each member of society according to their natural aptitudes and inclinations. And when you look at that a little more closely, that's where you find the system of varna and ashram. Uh, varna being the social position for every person according to their natural inclination, and uh, ashram uh, 
your position according to the stage of life you're in. So just very, very briefly, uh, in the social structure, you have Brahmins, which are the spiritually enlightened intellectuals who act as the <clears throat> excuse me, head of the social body. The Kshatriyas, the uh, warriors and administrators who protect society, so they're like the arms of the social body, the chest of the social body. The Vaishyas, or the entrepreneurs, the people who run businesses, who engage in farming, so agriculture and commerce, everything that the society needs in order to have uh, the necessities of life, and they're like the belly of society. And then finally, the Shudras, who are the uh, skilled workers. Uh, that would be anyone from an engineer who uh, designs a bridge to the construction worker who builds the bridge, or someone who designs uh, software, who writes code, uh, people who work for a living, basically. Uh, and they act as the legs of society. They make the social body stand up and run. So those are your social divisions. And and I just want to quickly note that the de-evolution of this system over time into a corrupt and uh, exploitative system is what we know as the caste system. Yeah, yeah. So I want to make a real clear distinction that the uh, very class-conscious, uh, birth-oriented caste system, you, you, uh, you are what you are born into, is a completely different idea from the system of Varnas, where your the nature of your work <clears throat> and uh, your <clears throat> excuse me the qualities of your consciousness determine where you are in the social order. So, someone born of a shudra could be a brahmin. Someone who is born of a kshatriya could end up uh, being. A Vaisha, you know, there's social mobility in the system of Varnas that you don't see in the caste system. Yeah, I want to. I actually want to ask a little more about that because this is something that I had written down to talk to you about as well. Because I think you are in this chapter. At first, you you sort of unpack it, and I'm not sure if you're going to go into that discussion about the critique of the caste in relation <laughs> to this idea. And so I, re I remember it was like one of the one part of the book where I started to bristle a little bit. I wasn't sure because because you know most people in maybe at least contemporary Western society, do have a resistance to any kind of class understanding of, of society. But you, you know, you do, you do well in the book to kind of, um, to draw attention to the nuance. But I, I want to kind of push a little more in, because I felt, I felt like at least I didn't pick up on what that, uh, what that would look like in terms, if we were to kind of grasp the the wisdom of the varnas in in a contemporary way, how how would that manifest? Because I imagine it wouldn't be an institutionalization of the varnas. Because because from my from my way of looking at things, it seems like it's the institutionalization that then leads to the corruption. So what is the relationship with? the Varnas as an idea that would actually lead to a more fruitful, um, balanced, and maybe we could even say progressive um, uh, expression of this idea, of this truth? Yeah, this is a really good question. And uh, in one respect, it's something that I'm kind of wrestling with right now. Um, and the reason is because you have this ideal, which sounds great, uh, and then you have the reality of what we have right now, which is not so great. How do you get from what we've got now to this ideal? Is it possible? Is it desirable? Do we really want to do that? And if so, what are the interstitial steps? Are there steps or does everything have to fall apart and be built again from scratch? Mm -hmm. um, we may have no choice uh, if there is uh, a complete and utter environmental and economic collapse, which is entirely possible given the state of the world, both in terms of uh, our environment and the unsustainability of our worldwide financial system, uh, the whole thing may fall apart and we may get a chance to build the thing from scratch, however painful that may be. Better that uh, we slam on the brakes and figure out how to rebuild a functional society and a sustainable society. Uh, and I think that we can begin by recognizing that these four divisions are naturally occurring divisions. You can look at any society, however much it may deny 
any kind of class consciousness or hierarchical distribution of people, and you'll find it's there. You know, it, you can go to say uh, a communist country, and you'll still see, even though it's supposedly a classless society that you have people who are inclined towards intellectualism and spirituality. There are people who are inclined towards uh, being in the military. There are people who are inclined towards doing business, and there are people who are inclined towards working with their hands. It's a naturally occurring thing. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I created this. This is how it is. So there's no sense in denying it. Another way to understand this is to see the decline of Western civilization in terms of the decline of this system. So if you go back into the beginning of recorded history, uh, you find philosopher kings, you find uh, a, a class of spiritual thinkers who guided the uh, monarchs, who then uh, Got, you know, were in control of the people who uh, generated all of the money and the food, who uh, employed all the people who did the labor. The Brahmins, or the head of society, when they become corrupt, when they lose their qualification to lead society, then the monarchs think, what do we need them for? We can run things without them. They should be working for us. And so now you have the idea of a monarchy to which the spiritual intellectuals are subordinate. They, they no longer advise, but rather they act as uh, the mouthpiece that gets everyone to follow along. And now you get the opiate of the people in the terms of religion. Yeah. Uh, when the kings become disqualified, because they're no longer, they, they become corrupt and exploitive, then the people who make all the money think, what do we need them for? We're the ones who control uh, the, the, the money. We should be running things. And so they take control. They get the military to work for them. And uh, religion retains its even its position as being that which uh, scares people into obedience. And that's what we have now. Yeah. We have basically rule by business people. Yeah. Well, wow, that's a really that's such an interesting way. I don't think I've ever heard it narrativized in that way, and I think it's really illuminating because it, that you totally do see that progression in a certain kind of way. And 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 the scary thing is what what happens. I mean, it's already scary now, but according to this logic, the next thing that happens is military. Well, no, the next thing that happens is uh, the Shudras take over. Mm. They say, hey, all the business people are exploiting the hell out of us, but we're the ones who make things run. Mm. We should be in charge. Oh. And that's Marx's idea. Now yes. you have Marxism. Okay. okay, yes. So then the military becomes the instrument of the Shudras, the, the, the laborer class, who make up most of the military now anyway. Uh, and that becomes an instrument for... Uh, the rise of, of uh, communism, mm -hmm. which, which we, what you had for a while in the Soviet Union, which didn't work, and what you had for a, a while in China, which then became just a, a nationalized capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see if it ever actually rolls around to the uh, legs of society becoming the head of society. Uh, but if we understand, if we look at history in that way, then we can understand how we got to where we are. And now the question becomes, well, how are people going to revert back to the system? You need Brahmins. You need spiritually enlightened intellectuals to lead society. Mm. Okay, well, that's where yoga comes in. Because if people take to the path of yoga, a spiritual path of yoga that actually leads to the elevation and purification of consciousness, then we may yet reach a critical mass of Brahmins that can actually be qualified to lead society. Hmm. Which is also Plato's idea, actually, mm -hmm. in the Republic. Yes, very, yeah. very similar. Huh, that's interesting. There's I mean, a lot I, of Plato in yoga philosophy. Yeah, right. I mean, f 
I, I don't know. I've, I, I, it's, it's a, it's an interesting ideal, but it, you know, I, I guess for me and my own imagination, it's hard for me to, to hold in the same space the, the spiritual guide and the highest position of power. You know, it just feels like the high. I mean, uh, from one perspective, I guess you could say, well, that's the, the these are the only class of people that could actually hold that kind of power without being corrupted by it. But maybe there's something about that hierarchical power distribution that is just inherently corruptive to those at the top. I don't know. I'm that's that's sort of my my skepticism about that whole uh, the whole idea. And it's reasonable skepticism, because throughout recorded history, we have uh plenty of evidence to support the notion that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It is very, very rare to find someone who has transcendental knowledge, genuine detachment, who is genuinely disinterested in gaining something, who has no ulterior material motive for being in a leadership position. It's very, very rare to find uh, a person who is qualified in that way, and rarer still to find people who can exercise power who will defer to such a person for guidance. Yeah. So that's where the challenge of making that ideal a reality comes in. You need people who are actually uh, sufficiently purified and disinterested in material life because they're absorbed in uh, spiritual life, and such a person is very rare. I mean, it seems like the the only way in which such a thing would be possible would be for it to happen in a more grassroots way. So, like the rise of more intentional communities as being sort of like almost the status quo of how we live. Do you do you see that as something that we may start to see more of in uh, as sort of the federal level of things gets more and more? And, you know, distasteful. Do you think we're going to see a movement towards more, um, I mean, uh, for lack of a better word, communal living? Yes. I, I don't see it happening any other way. I think it really has to happen on a micro local level first uh, so that you have a functional model of what it looks like on a really, really small scale and then have that kind of intentional community uh, proliferate uh, and I think that that will become more and more necessary, yeah. not just it won't even be a matter of choice. It'll be a matter of this is how we survive in the world as time goes on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hari, what are the fourth and fifth uh, functions of yoga philosophy? Um, so uh, actually there is a part of the... Uh, sociological function that I uh, didn't finish up on. So let me just run back quickly to that. Okay. Uh, the ashrams, the stages of life, uh, which are uh, brahmachari, when one is a youthful student from the zero to 25th year, uh, household life, or the grahasta ashram from the 25th to the 50th year, the vanaprastha ashram, uh, retired life, from the 50th to the 75th year, and if one is fortunate enough to get past that, then sannyas, renunciation, uh, just kind of walking away from the world and focusing entirely on practicing uh, the art and science of self-realization and teaching others how to do the same. The psychological function serves the purpose of making it possible to be happy or at least content in any situation. So your happiness is based on your internal state of being or the condition of your consciousness rather than external conditions in your life. Uh, this is how we move through the world equipoised, irrespective of what's going on around us. Uh, and that's one of the symptoms of someone who is said to be in advanced in knowledge or advanced in the practice of yoga. And then finally, the illuminative function which is the ability to recreate the revelatory experience of the author of a yoga wisdom text. So a yoga wisdom text exists not just for the sake of giving us armchair philosophy, but rather it contains knowledge of relationships and knowledge of practices and knowledge of an ultimate goal that those practices are meant to take us to. And 
so by the practical application in our lives, according to our particular time and circumstance, of the teachings that are given to us in the yoga wisdom texts of antiquity, we can recreate the experience of self-realization that the self-realized person who wrote the book experienced for themselves. Mm. Excellent. So Good now, um, since we're talking about, you know, we're reflecting a little bit on critiques of, of contemporary society. You have a lot of interesting, actually, observations about this that I want to kind of draw upon. So I'll just ask you kind of a general question, then I'll, and, then I'll, and then I'll ask specific questions on what stood out to me. So what are, what are some of, besides what we've been talking about, what are some of the obstacles in our contemporary cultural value system that you see as limiting our understanding of what yoga philosophy is about and how we can implement it in our lives? <sighs> Well, our values, our material values, are based on illusion, on a misidentification of the self with the not-self. So I'm thinking, uh, I'm a man, I'm an American, I'm white, I'm straight, uh, I'm a middle-aged guy, uh, and we have a tendency to identify in this way, which leads to the idea that the place I was born is worshipable just because I was born there. Uh, we start to believe things about um, our own country, which are just temporary material designations having nothing to do with our eternal spiritual identity. Um, and we have imperfect senses. You know, we can make mistakes. We have a tendency to uh, see things as they are not rather than as they are. Uh, and then if the way things are isn't conducive to the way we want them to be, then we have a propensity to cheat. Uh, there's, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of things in our way. Uh, the values of yoga are the four pillars of dharma, uh, which are um, austerity or the renunciation of materialism, so we don't pursue more than we need. We, simplicity is, is a value of yoga. Um, purity of thought, word, and deed, cleanliness in our own personal being and also in our environment. So a yogi is naturally an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, one of the characteristics of a Brahmin is that a Brahmin always leaves a place cleaner than they found it. Mm -hmm. uh, then mercy, which of course correlates to ahimsa, nonviolence. Um, we, and, and I'm going to come back to this in just a second. The fourth value is truthfulness. So these uh, these values all have correlating actions uh, that we can we can uh, undertake, and I think that communicating these values clearly first in the yoga community and then to society at large will help us overcome some of these obstacles. Uh, for example. Um, the first order of ethical imperative in the Yoga Sutras is ahimsa, nonviolence, or compassion for all beings. And it's universal. Uh, Patanjali makes it clear that there's no excuse not to do this. Under all circumstances, everyone has to do this if you're doing the yoga of this system. Right. Um, so that corresponds to mercy. Uh, therefore, you take the path of non-harming. You do that which does the least harm to other people, other living beings, be it uh, animals uh, or, or plants. They're, you be kind to Mother Nature. Uh, you live in harmony with Mother Nature. Uh, therefore, uh, as a spiritual activist, one would naturally be an environmentalist. And uh, if we are going to be truthful, then we will acknowledge that the biggest contributor to global warming is actually the food industry, specifically the animals for food industry, and therefore our non-cooperation is that we don't eat animals for food, and we don't make excuses 
that somehow or other I'm the exception to this rule, that it's okay for me to eat animals for this reason or that reason. Um, so that's how mercy and truthfulness will go together. Now we live in the age, the, the post-truth era, uh, <laughs> therefore, you know, it's all the more important for us to embrace truthfulness. And truthfulness means you acknowledge facts, you acknowledge reality, you live uh, according to the truth and not just our own conception of the truth, not just our personal truth. There's a big difference between a personal truth where you create your own reality and the personal realization of an absolute objective truth. And this is, I think, one of the big stumbling blocks uh, for people who are inclined to postmodern thinking is this idea that we have our own equally valid personal truths. And my personal truth is just as valid as your personal truth. And, you know, that falls apart very quickly as soon as you get to a personal truth that's in conflict with your personal truth. Uh, you know, it, I, I will hear this a lot in yoga teacher training uh, philosophy courses where the argument is, well, that's not my personal truth. My personal truth is like this, and it's just as valid as yours. And I'll turn that around, and I'll say, okay, well, my personal truth is that if you don't believe in God exactly the way I believe in God, then I have the God-given right to kill your husband and take you and your children and make them my slaves. Is that okay with you? Is that a valid personal truth? No, it's not. Okay, so now let's throw that idea out the window and look at what yoga has to say about an objective absolute truth and how conformance to that truth in living in harmony with that truth is actually what yoga is from a traditional sense. So we have obstacles on both sides. We have obstacles from a society that has this kind of uh, conservative conception of materialistic exploitation of nature for the sake of our sense enjoyment, and that's the goal of life. We have obstacles uh, on the side of postmodern thinking that relativizes everything, and yoga is neither of those things. So sometimes I think we have a false dichotomy between uh, secular modernism or secular postmodernism and religious fundamentalism, and there's actually a third option, which is transcendental spirituality, which we find in traditional yoga. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad that you, you brought that up because that, that's one of the things I have written down here is your idea of yoga is not postmodern. And, and I really appreciated that because I feel like that's not talked about enough because, you know, the, the teachings are often appropriated as you're saying, as this kind of way of sort of, um, you know, illuminating my own personal truth. Like the, these, you know, these practices are here for me to just get more, you know, acquainted with my myself and how and how and how special I am and and not that we're not equally special but but the idea that you know yoga is about um, affirming one's personal truth as opposed to other personal truths is is totally misleading and I've never really understood that idea and I'm I, I liked the example that you used about <clears throat> about someone having a personal truth that is that is you know so diabolical no one could actually stomach it but it, it, it people often entertain that or eth this ethic of of um, um, you know just respect everybody's opinions no matter how ridiculous but then when you give an actual concrete example of one that actually couldn't be entertained because it would be the end of your existence mm -hmm. so there's something more there you know and and so I, I appreciate you bringing it up like that People want to feel good about themselves. Yeah. And why not? Mm -hmm. um, if we understand ourselves as being eternal, gifted with complete knowledge and perfect feeling, well, then, then we'll feel good about ourselves. But if we're trying to feel good about ourselves in a temporary misidentification, if we're thinking of ourselves as this personality that we identify with, it'll be a lot harder uh, to feel good about yourself just because it's, it's a temporary designation. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of psychological baggage that, that goes along with this misidentity. So I think a lot of self-care in yoga is misapplied 
into feeling good about your misidentification, your your false yes. ego. Yeah. yeah. Rather than feeling good about the fact that on a spiritual level, uh, I'm eternal. I mean, if, if we actually experienced ourselves as eternal, what would you have to worry about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like you're it's like you're reading my mind. This is literally you're like touching all the points I have about the stuff you brought up because um the the idea of like self-care and self you say self-care and self-love are the hallmarks of a narcissistic culture, <laughs> which I thought was really great. Someone asked you a question about that and I was like, "Yes, you tell it how it is, Hari. I love that." Um but uh so and and it reminded me actually of a question that I received when I was it was teaching a, a workshop where someone asked, you know, well, how do I reconcile this idea that I think that I hear yoga philosophy is telling me, which is about my self-acceptance with this, um, with this uh, prescription or, um, I don't know, prerogative to, trans, to, not, to, to reach towards the absolute or to, mm-hmm. to try to realize the, the absolute in my own, through my practice in my own experience. Do you, would you say that, there, that the idea that yoga is about self-acceptance is wrong-headed or would you just put it a different way? I'd put it a different way. I think the overemphasis on uh, self-care and self-acceptance is the symptom of the narcissistic society, and it's very easy for us to fall into that trap. I think that it is important for us to accept ourselves as we are in our conditioned state and where we are at relative to the state of self-realization. There's no point in beating ourselves up because we're not self-realized, and we certainly don't want to fall into the trap of low self-esteem, which is very different from genuine humility, uh, in, when we think about how we are in our conditioned life. We've collaborated with the universe, with the Paramatma, to create the person that we appear to be. That is the person that we know when, uh, that we're aware of in terms of our likes, dislikes, what we think is good, what we think is bad, and just our state of being, how we are in the world, our particular disposition uh, in the world. And I think that we can relax and be comfortable with that. This is the persona I have created, and therefore I will accept that this is where I am right now. Um, One way to think about this that works for me at least uh, as a devotee of Krishna is to remember that Krishna is the Uh, supreme person or the form of the supreme being that facilitates the deepest expression of love and the deepest potential for a relationship of love between an individual living entity and the complete absolute truth. And Krishna thinks I'm so cool that he wants to hang out with me. (laughs) Now, If Krishna, who is the supreme, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent being, thinks I'm so cool that he wants to hang out with me, then why am I thinking myself in anything other than the same terms? Mm -hmm. You know, if Krishna thinks I'm all that, then I should have a, a similar opinion of myself even in the condition I'm in now, because Krishna's love is unconditional and eternal. So remembering that we are unconditionally loved by the Supreme Person exactly as we are uh, acts as both a hedge against falling into the ego trip of low self-esteem and encourages us to reciprocate with Krishna by loving back. And in bhakti yoga, it is by offering our love that the true nature of our being is revealed Mm. from within our heart. Mm. So, (coughs) excuse me. So asking um, it 
in in terms of this is sort of backtracking a little bit, but I, I for somebody that you know one thing that stood out in your book was was the idea about faith and knowledge as not being on sort of opposite sides of a spectrum. In fact, we always are operating in any kind of knowledge that we have. We're always operating on a certain kind of fundamental faith, and f- faith, faith is sort of. <clears throat> primary in that sense. So, but, but you also point out that your faith is then, your faith is then sort of legitimated by the experimentation. So then in that way, you know, um, the, the, the practice of yoga is scientific, um, which you might say, you know, is the same as any scientist. I mean, a scientist only goes on a certain, um, trajectory of, of engagement based on a certain hypothesis, but they, that's sort of, they have that hypothesis based on faith. And then they do the experiments to see sort of if that hypothesis has any, um, you know, ground in reality. But so for, so in the, in the context of something like Krishna, someone who's still hesitant, um, to, to um, to see the supreme self as a person, because for those that are maybe more attracted to Vedanta or Shaivism, there's a, a kind of you know the the formless absolute and the idea that I am um, one with that formless absolute is something that is 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 easier for them to sink their teeth into. I think than the idea that um, that God is a person. So so you know if that if the supreme okay if reality is a supreme person which is where your book ends at and we're ending at the, we're getting to the close of the interview so this is sort of a, maybe a good note to end on if reality is a supreme person how do i um how do i uh practice in a way that allows that um truth to be realized i mean i, I don't know if this is a very clear question but hopefully you understand what i'm trying to get at Clear enough. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So our faith in a particular conception, uh, our our, our faith in God, the nature of our faith determines uh, our conception of God, um, or our conception of God determines the nature of our faith or whether or not we have faith. Uh, So, for example... If your conception of God is of a non-person, then we would strive to eliminate all aspects of personality from our own experience of ourselves. Uh, From the standpoint of uh, bhakti yoga, that would be a kind of spiritual suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, If your conception of God is a kind of jealous, angry old man who will send you to hell forever for not believing in him, well, then you might think, I can think of something higher than that, Uh, something, a better idea of God than that. I'm not going to believe in that God. And if that's the only God there is, I won't believe in God at all. If your conception of God is of a beautiful, ever youthful, playful, person who just loves you and will always love you, then your faith will be to respond accordingly to that conception of God. Mm -hmm. So faith is the mandatory prerequisite for knowledge, as as you were describing, Uh, whether you're a scientist or a yogi or whether you're crossing the street. You know, when you step into the crosswalk, you don't know for sure that the car that stopped at the light is going to stay stopped at the light. You have reasonable faith that they won't hit the accelerator when you're halfway across the street. Yeah. So faith plays a part in our lives all the time, and we just don't really think about it. Yeah. So the question is just a matter of, is your faith reasonable? And if you have reasonable faith uh, that something is true, then you act on the basis of your reasonable faith and you find out directly by experience whether or not it's true. So that's how we execute our practice of yoga. Uh, We begin with reasonable faith. We take up the practice based on that faith. And then we have the experience. So this is the difference between jnana, theoretical knowledge based on reasonable faith, and vigyana, or realized knowledge, experiential knowledge, which is just a matter of applied theoretical knowledge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I like I like the way you put that because one of the things actually that was interesting and in this idea of reasonable faith, you contrast with. Um, or you challenge, and I wanted to get to this, but I think we'll leave it for another day, but you challenge the absolute non-dualism of Vedanta on its own logical inconsistencies. So so you say, so my, the implication of that is that it doesn't, we don't have, we can't have a reasonable faith in something that poses such a stark logical inconsistency. And so even though, you know, from, I don't know, from a certain perspective, the, the supreme person at for, on, on face value might seem reality as a supreme person for someone who is maybe skeptical or is, you know, embedded in a certain scientific, scientific worldview. It might be, um, uh, it might be hard to, to swallow. There is a philosophical kind of hashing out of this idea within the bhakti yoga tradition that can lead to a certain kind of reasonable faith it's like oh actually this idea is is intellectually concrete it 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 you know to the to, to, as much as it is um as much as it needs to for me it, it kind of bypasses the logical inconsistencies and i can work with that is that sort of the idea that then you yeah yeah just to quickly wrap this up for you um Vedanta, the Vedanta Sutras begin with the proposition, now just try to understand Brahman and then a definition of Brahman, that from which all things, uh, or that from whom all things proceed. Uh, those are the first two sutras. I'm a person, and I don't doubt my own existence, because if I did, then there'd be someone who was doubting, and thank you, Descartes, for a wonderful moment in uh, Western philosophy. So I exist. I'm a person. I And Patanjali describes us as Purusha, person. So you're a person, I'm a person, everybody else is a person. Where does this personness come from? The quality of being a person must come from the source of our being, and Brahman is the source of everything, and Krishna confirms also in the Bhagavad Gita, I'm the source of everything, everything comes from me. Uh, therefore, the attribute of personness must be present in the source of our being, in Brahman. Brahman must have a personal attribute. Now the question becomes, well, which is higher? The impersonal aspect of an all-pervading ground of being, as we find in the perennial philosophy, or the personal aspect of the supreme being? Well, the personal aspect is the aspect that facilitates a relationship with, of love. And what makes us happier than to have a relationship of love, where our love is uh, accepted and reciprocated in full, ad infinitum, infinitely? Well, I can't think of a higher truth than that. And if the philosophical argument for the existence of God is God is the highest truth that you can conceive of, well, then that's what I'm going with, because I can't conceive of a higher truth than a person who is the sum total of reality, the substance of reality, and the source of reality, and at the same time, completely transcendental to everything, with whom I can have a relationship of unlimited love. Mm. And if someone can come up with a higher truth than that for me, then I'll accept that. But so far, that's the highest truth I've been able to come up with. Awesome. Awesome. That's a really good explanation. So actually, before we close, I want to ask you one last question. Maybe we'll make it, we'll make it uh, as brief as we can. But, okay. uh, but it is sort of a big question, so maybe, maybe it'll be hard. But the cultural appropriation debate you bring up in, in your book around um, the argument, you know, yoga belongs to Hinduism. And I did want to just bring this up because it is sort of one of those things that is, per, you know, perking up a lot or poking up a lot. Mm -hmm. And 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 you bring up a really good point about why this is sort of a wrong-headed idea. So I'd love it if you would just give us sort of the um, the abridged version of that of that argument as to why yoga does not belong to Hinduism alone. Sure, yoga is a transcendental science. It, it is not. Of earthly origin, at least if you were to believe what the tradition says about itself. Yeah. Most people do not accept the idea of a supernatural source of anything, including a lot of people who practice yoga. Um, this cuts directly to the 
uh, primary tension between traditional yoga and modern thinking, which is, uh, in traditional yoga, consciousness precedes matter. And matter forms around consciousness uh, according to the qualities it comes in contact with in, in the material world. The modern way of thinking is consciousness is a product of matter, or is at the very least uh, uh, simultaneous with matter uh, and evolving in some form along with matter, or it is matter itself that is conscious. Mm -hmm. Well, yoga doesn't subscribe to that kind of thinking. So the uh, idea that yoga belongs to Hinduism uh, can't be right if we are to take yoga at its word that it is a transcendental science coming from a transcendental source beyond this world. It is, it is not a product of this world. Uh, Hinduism itself, uh, the idea of Hinduism as an organized religion, doesn't really show up until... Uh, the 13, 14, 1500s, when the word Hindu, which is a, an anglicized version of a Persian word, uh, starts to be used by people who live in India and practice what is more properly called Sanatan Dharma in order to make a distinction between themselves and the Muslim invaders who were ruling India at that time. Uh, the British picked up the word and dropped it into the world's vocabulary to describe all the people who were not Muslims living in India. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras, all the literature upon which Hinduism is based precede anything that we call Hinduism. So even on that count, uh, the literature is uh, so ancient that it precedes uh, any conception of Hinduism as an ethnic identity or a national identity or even as an institutionalized religion to the extent you can even say that Hindu has an institution. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a great, that's a great note to end on. So, um, just, uh, to, as we wrap up then, uh, Hari, if you want to share anything about, um, about any projects that are, you're, are going on, you're releasing this book. Do you know, do you have a publication date for that? At the time of our conversation right now, I don't have an exact release date. Okay. Uh, but uh, by the time this airs, I should have a release date. So if anyone wants to visit my website and find out, uh, you know, when the book will be actually available, uh, that'll be great. And your uh, and your website is hari dash kirtana dot com. And that's H A R I for those listening dash K K I R T A N A dot com, correct? Right. All right. And then any workshops, trainings, retreats that you're um, hosting coming up? My long term project right now is a series of workshops on spiritual activism. What makes activism spiritual? Why do you want to make spirit, uh, activism spiritual? Uh, how does that imbue our activism with power that it would not otherwise have? Uh, and uh, the series of talks will be transformed into a book. Uh, and that's what I'm working on right now. That's amazing. All right. That sounds great. I can't wait to read that or come to some of those workshops. All right. Well, I hope you can make it. Yeah. It'll be down in D.C.? Yeah, this series will be uh, in D.C. Uh, I go where I'm invited, so... Uh, yeah, please come to New York. We'll have to invite you up. It, it's always nice to uh, come home. All right. All right, well, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, Hari, and uh, uh, thanks so much for offering your time, and, um, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Hi, right, Jacob. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you, and I hope we get a chance to do it again soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.